So, so you know, I'm, I'm a teacher, I'm an economist, so certainly I will try to have a kind of presentation which is probably more like a university lecture, you know, that I certainly you can stop and challenge me at any time. As, as it is always happens, you know, that I, I wanted to start with something, then and I forget to change the, the order, and I have to, to start with the second, second slide. And basically, you know, that you have heard already that, that our generation basically leaves the problems for you, but we not only leave the problems for you, we meet the problems for you. So my generation basically made the problems for you. And, and you know, the economists or you can you can call them demographists and anything else, you know, that Thomas Martin, more than 200 years ago, you know, that he was speaking about the problem that the, the world population is growing rapidly, it doesn't, certainly doesn't hurt, but you see the red line there, mean by the, the resources and especially the food uh, production is growing only linearly, so they are crossing each other and it will create a conflict. And if you look, you know that just 50 years ago, in 1968, the Love of Rome was uh, created, you know, and they published the book to the limits to growth in 1972. And it's interesting to see, you know, that basically they are still very much speaking about natural resources, that, that we are out of natural resources. If you look at these graphs, you know that in, in, in around 2050, you know that we will be out of resources, and, and certainly none of, none of them true. So, so Malthus was not right because of the he forget about the technological or, or technical or scientific development, and these guys you know that it is failed according to the natural resource estimation. We are not out of resources. We cannot use all the oil because if you if we would use it, then we would cook the earth, so it will probably not happen. But it doesn't mean that, that these guys, you know, that were not right. And what they said, it was, it was wrong. And I, I would like to show you just, you know, that I, when I started to deal with these problems, you know, that I had an excellent scholar, you know, that David Pierce, you know, that and, and unfortunately he passed away in 2005, but, but he had a chance to give me a lecture in 1994. In, in my office, you know, that we were drinking some wine, and certainly we wanted to solve the problems of the, of the earth, you know, that, and he summarized what does it mean, you know, that how we can solve the problems. And he started to speak about, you see, the, the circular economy. You see the first slide. The second is the decoupling. We can separate the economic growth from the pollution. And the third one is, is about the service economy or flow economy. It's about the stock economy. So basically, interesting, you know, that I, am, I, I had the chance to hear his lecture in 1940, you know, that, and, and in, in the last 20, more than 20 years, you know, that I think so, nothing new in, in this field. So what he said those days, you know, that we are just trying to rephrase these problems, you know, that, but, but basically what he said is still, still true. And, and certainly, you know, the, the funny thing that meanwhile in the last 50 years, so you remember that the Club of Rome happened 50 years ago, they were starting to speak about the problems, and if you look the, the last 50 years, you know that this is the so-called anthropocene. Everything is growing exponentially. Even the paper uh, use, you know, that mean by they are having the computers, you know, that they are printing books, they are making copies of everything, you know. That, so even the paper use is increasing. Meanwhile. Leon Thiev, you know, that wrote an article, he was an Nobel Prize winner in economics, you know, that he wrote an article in 1972 that, you know, the office without paper. And, and you can see that it's not without paper. With paper we are printing, using the, the computers, but, but everything growing rapidly, the world population growing, the GDP is growing, carbon dioxide emission is growing, everything is growing. Rapid. So some some guys, you know that, like uh, Ivan Rockström, you know that he is leading an institute in Sweden. He 
this is the so-called Resilience Center in order they, they published an article in Nature in, in 2009, you know that the first one, and they were starting to speak about the, the so-called planetary boundaries, and if you see the red line, it means that in this dimension, we are out of the boundaries. We cannot afford, the Earth cannot afford as much, you know, that CO2 emissions, we cannot afford the extinction of, of species, and so on and so forth. But they published a new one in 2015, you know, that and interestingly, the climate change is not red anymore, it's, it's yellow. So it means it's dangerous, it is risky, but not, not the, the main problem. The main problem is the, the genetic diversity, the nitrogen, and phosphorus, basically, because the without artificial fertilizers, we will not be able to produce the necessary food for the humans. And maybe that, that they realize that if they are speaking too much about the climate change, that this is, this is too dangerous for the humans, you know that we will not act because they're useless to act. Some, you can convince the politicians if they have some hope to achieve something. If they have no hope to achieve something, they will not act. And we, we would need to, we, we would need to, to act some hope. And, and certainly, you know that when we are speaking about the boundaries, you mentioned already that this, uh, the, the 387 is not true anymore because, because it's, it's about 410. But when I was a student at the school, you know, and studied chemistry, I became the teacher of chemistry. It was a constant 280 for 14,000 years. So, so can you imagine? For 14,000 years, it used to be 280. And from 2009, you know that it is increasing almost 30 ppm, which is, which is a huge change. So when we are speaking about the climate, it's really something dangerous. But, but interestingly, you know that I, I see a lot of efforts. I told you that, that the Club of Rome, you know, the, the politicians, the UN, uh, organizing different events, you know, that and, and, and professors at the university is teaching, you know, that everybody's speaking about these issues, you know, how it, how it happened that in the last 50 years, you know, that what we achieved, you know, that it's increasing, increasing, increasing. We, we cannot <coughs> change even the, the rate of, of, of increase according to the, the CO2 concentration in, in the Earth. Earth. And, and I have found something which is quite interesting again, you know, that I, I don't know why everything happened when I, I was a student at the university. I just finished the university. It, it was written in this article in 1973, you know that. And Rittel, you know and Weber published an article, you know that, and, and, and speaking about the dilemmas in, in general, the theory of planning, the social planning dilemmas, you know that. And, and there is a, a very uh, easy, easy way, you know, that we can see that the, the majority of the problems, you know, that are, are easy to understand and easy to solve. And you can create professions to solve them. You are studying something at the university, you are not studying something that you will be gen generalist. You would like to be a professional, engineer, economist, manager, you know, that, uh, or doctor, or, or lawyer, or something like that. Nobody <coughs> able to teach somebody who is not a, gen, not, not a professional, but a, so a generalist. So the, the, the professional people love the problems, you know, because they, they can develop the data, they analyze the data, they formulate the solution, and they implement the solution. And, and, and it's done. So give me a problem, this is the engineer, give me a problem, this is the business guy, you know, that I, I will fix it. I'm able to fix it, even, but what is the problem? If you are able to define what is the problem, I am able to fix it. But in, in the social problems are typically not problems like that. These are wicked problems. What, what does it mean, wicked problems? There is no definition for, for a wicked problem. We, don't, we are not able to define it. We are not able to formalize what is the problem. We start to do something, and we, we try to achieve 
some kind of solutions because we know that we have a problem, but what is the problem? So for example, the life expectancy of people in order to are poor, what is the problem? Education, food, what, 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 is, what is really the problem? The problem, yes, the life ex expectancy looks like the problem, but it's not, not really the problem. But how to solve it? So basically, you know that no stopping rule is it's not like I, I start to do something, you know, that and I finish it and I can can definitely know that this is a good solution or a bad solution. This is the optimal solution or not optimal solution. So it means that we are we are doing something, you know, that we are not able to tell what is the problem that we are solving. We, we don't know whether it is solved or not, or we created a new problem because we try to do something, we are Invent, inventing something in order and, and we never know we cannot test the solution so you can build a bridge and you can you can test it you know that whether here and you can model it you know that whether it will be a good bridge or a bad one but, but for the socialist problem this is not not the case so if you, if you look at the problem you know that unfortunately many designers many planner many social planner and any of them will start to do something you know, sometimes they meet with each other, A and B time, they meet with each other. And you would think that they are, they are approaching some, some uh, kind of consensus, but it's not the case. Their opinion will be totally different. What is the problem, how to solve it, what to do, whether, whether what we did already is good or bad, you know, that they will totally disagree. If you have more than two, five, ten, all of them, you know, that it's oscillation. They, they know something about the problem and they realize that what they did till now, this is totally wrong. They have to, to, to find a new way to, to solve the problem which is, which is not defined. So if you look this, you know that the, the problem is that, that you, can, you cannot learn from the previous cases. Even interestingly, you know that the, the Rittel mentioned that even if you build a metro, in, in a city. <coughs> you think so that you are able to build a metro anywhere because you, you did it once, but it's not the case. Because each case is totally different. You have to collect the data, you have to evaluate the data, you have to do a lot of things, but you are not able to repeat what you did somewhere in, 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 in the space. So we, we have a problem in order to, in, in Hungary we have the problem with the with the gypsy society, how to integrate them in order to, in the US, you have another problems, you know, that in, in everywhere somebody has social problems, but, but you, we cannot not learn from the others. You cannot implement their, their way of, of solving these kind of problems. You, each problem is unique, and you have to develop the, the tools to solve in, in place, you know, that you have to learn from your problems, not for, from other problems. It doesn't mean certainly that that you cannot uh, do anything, but, but basically this is, this is a big problem. And, and how we react, you know, that so that, so that when we are speaking about the problems, you know, that basically the UN is, is ready to sit together a lot, of, a lot of ambassadors, you know, that a lot of scientists, you know, that they try, try to define what are the problems. So in, in year 2000, they, they uh, you know, they defined eight so-called millennium development goals. And you see them, you know, one by one, and they set the goals till 2015. They will solve it, or at least they will improve these problems. Certainly, then, they get together in 2015 and they realize that the problem are not solved and they, they started to, to define you know, the, the problems again and they, they ended with 17 problems. So they were very, very proud of it, you know, that instead of eight, they were able to define 17 problems. Some of the problems separated, you know, that you have no poverty, no hunger, zero hunger and so on and so forth. But you, you feel that these problems are probably interrelated. But when, when you have eight problems, this is probably eight agency, eight ministry, or something like that. If you have 17 problems, these are 17 agencies, you know, that and the agencies, all of them will have their own goals, you know, that they will compete with each other, who is solving what. And instead of having a holistic 
the approach you know that you are you are differentiating the problems, you are separating, you are trying to to create professions to solve these kind of problems. Meanwhile, these are wicked problems, no profession which will solve them. Basically, we, we would need a collaborative problem solving, but if you have agency, you have people, they have their personal interests, you know that, and, and you are moving further instead of, uh, of nearer to, the, to, to solving the problems. I, I know that this is a little bit boring, you know, that and I, I can imagine that, that some of the diplomats would be not happy if I would tell them this, but, but certainly this is my personal opinion, so I would be more happy to have the eighth one, you know, that, and to try to solve them, or at least to, to try to define what, what, what we achieve, what we are not achieved, because the, the 17th problem is a little bit, a little bit too many. And, yeah, I hear the computer, and, and it's not in harmony, you see, the holistic, you speak about policy, but, but I'm not able to, to follow my, my style. But there is one, one question, you know, that when, when we, as I mentioned, the one problem is basically that, that these are wicked problems, you know, that, and, and we are not ready to realize that the wicked problems, you know, that are, are problems which we need a holistic approach and need cooperation instead of competing you know that, or instead of having having agencies trying to, to find professionals who are dealing with the issues, we, the, the society should solve them. You know that we, we need to cover. But the other interesting problem that you know that we used to teach about economic growth, that the economic growth is a is a good phenomenon because it will solve the solve the problems. They create some problems, but it will solve the problems. We, we used to mention the name of of the. Simon Kuznets, you know, that he got the Nobel Prize again in 1971. You know, in 1971 he got the Nobel Prize because of the economic growth. In 72 they published a book, To the Limits to Growth, you know, that they not, were not communicating with each other. But Kuznets basically said, you know, that then, then the economic growth is serving and providing the public goods. So if you are if the country is growing or the economy is growing, we will have a better education, we will have a better health care system, you, you take care of the environmental protection and so on and so forth. But the bad news is that in the last, at least in the last 30 years, it seems to us that unfortunately the economic growth is not serving anymore the so-called public, they are not creating the necessary public goods. And if you look this, certainly you know that you can you can criticize. Certainly, we are taking pictures, you know, that or graphs from the literature what we like. This is again from the from the book of the Club of Rome, you know, that uh, Ernst Weizsäcker published it, you know, that and they published it because of the 50 years anniversary of the Club of Rome, you know, which came out in 2018. And you see that there is a high correlation. You know that between the problems and between the, the, the income distribution inequality. So if you look here, you know that there are the U.S. up there and down there are some uh, Scandinavian countries, which shows you know that in, in Europe still exists in some countries at least the welfare state. Meanwhile, in other parts of the world it does not exist. These are all developed countries. And, and certainly it means that there is a huge dispute about it, whether you know that what is the what is the appropriate uh, welfare system, what is the appropriate health uh, uh, insurance system. You know that there is a huge debate everywhere, even in Europe, which is a little bit funny, because as I mentioned, you know that that basically the economy grows. If the economy is growing, then, then you have to take care of the social problems. And, and certainly you know that the US is rich enough to solve the social problems. So not the money is missing. Something else is wrong, basically. And if you look, you know that Thomas Piketty, certainly he is a young French, Economist, you know that, and he published a, a book 
recently, you know that, I'm, and basically he shows that that the world is changing. In uh, 1913, so 100 years, a little bit more than 100 years ago, 47 percent of the GDP were produced in, in Europe, and it went down to 25 percent. But the the 26 percent of the population used to live in Europe in 1913, and today only the 10 percent of the population living living in Europe, which is certainly you know that the world is changing. But but what what is more more obvious, if you look the this line, you know that he realized and this is a fact that the the return in Investment, so the capital return is is about five, six percent, six percent sometimes. Meanwhile, the economic growth is only one percent. So it means that the two line is going far and far from each other. And these are the the, uh, 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 the dates. You know that if you show that it used to be very high, the differences between the the return, the profit, you know that, and and the uh, and, uh, income from from uh, your uh, jobs, you know that. But it, it was in a harmony between between the two uh, world wars, you know that. But it started to to grow the difference between the two lines, which means basically that the top one percent of the of the U.S. citizens are getting. More and more, meanwhile, the bottom 50 is getting less and less. So the so the difference is, is growing rapidly. And if you look this, you know that basically from in 1980, you know that the, the poor and middle class get the larger incomes. You know that, that but in, in the year 2014, you know that the very very small portion, 0.1 per percent of the population getting the majority of the income. So, so it means that there is a huge change, you know, that in the income distribution. But certainly, you know, that there are other people who would like to convince you or convince us that the real problem, problem is overpopulation. And, and you can, you can, the statistics is a beautiful, beautiful science. You can find figures which will tell you that, but, but you see, this, this is not very convincing. So it means that basically, this graph would say that the, the problem is overpopulation. That regions where the population is growing rapidly, they are not uh, achieving the development goals. And those regions uh, where the population is growing not so rapidly, they are able to, to achieve the, the minimum development goals. And, and certainly, you know that Piketty, if you would look the cartoons, that the people would say that he is a Marxist, certainly because he realized something that exists, but, but easy to say that he is a Marxist, then you don't need to <coughs> argue, argue with him. You can say that this is a, this is a Marxism, you know that, but, but you can read his book. It's, it's quite a big one, you know that, and, and, and I can show that he is, he is uh, right. At least uh, nobody can, can criticize the facts of what he, <coughs> he said. You know that, and, and unfortunately, if you look this, you know that how the real income income grows you know that, and, and how it is distributed in the world. You know that you see that the, the so-called middle class, which which was always the target group, you know that the middle class income is going down. This is the so-called elephant curve. You know that, and. We are lucky that we have China, you know, that which is taking care, at least at the beginning of the of the graph. But but the world, unfortunately, is facing with this challenge that the, there is an elite who is who is became very rich and <coughs> they don't know much about the others. And I I would like to show you a few numbers, you know that, and and I know that this is not the newest one in 2009, but but very visible and unfortunately it didn't change too much. But these are these are totally new figures, you know, that in the European Union the average monthly income is about 2040, in the US and Canada 3050, <coughs> in Africa this is 
this is only 200. So when we are speaking about you know, the, the stress, why the people are living in Africa, you can imagine that those who are having as average 2,000 in a continent, you know, that they, they, they would like to, to move. China is, is going up a little bit. India is still 2,040. So these are huge differences. And basically, you know, some people would say that we would need a kind of global government who are able to take care of the global economy because we have the national governments, you know, that and they are dealing <coughs> with, with the country's issue, but we are, they are not able to regulate the global capital who are, who are walking around, you know, the world. And for the same kind of job, you know, that you can get about eight uh, US dollar in, in Hungary and you can get for the same job about 53 in Norway, but you can get in India one point seventeen, you know that these are very, very huge differences. That these, these are the same. And you can say that certainly that same or not same, but, but it's true that not not fifty times higher, you know, that uh, labor productivity in a in a tailor sense, you know, that in a in in, in uh, Norway than in, in India. So it it's not exist this huge huge difference. And and you know, you know that basically we, we are always crying for one solution, you know, that, and this is the innovation. But if you look at what is in the, in the uh, least interesting uh, driving force, then, then you will realize that to, to solve the world problems. So the people are, and even the researchers, are not, not thinking about to solve the world problems. The greediness and the, and the profit is the the driving force behind the behind the, the innovations, and some people would say that we, we, we would need innovation for free, you know, that, and not to to uh, set the the property rights for intellectual property because because we, we would have the solution for a lot of global warming issues, you know, that but we are not able able and not ready to distribute them among those nations which are poor. We are not able to, to search for those diseases which are not affecting the payable, you know, the demand and, and so on and so forth. So, and, and Stiglitz, Nobel Prize winner, you know, that then he, he said, you know, that okay, the top 1% have the best houses, best education, best doctors, best lifestyle, but they, they are not able to understand that they have to live together with the 99% of the population who, who is poor basically because they are, they are not distributing <coughs> income, income more in <coughs> and, and you know that certainly I, I would like to finish with a, a positive message, you know that which is, which is coming from <coughs> from Chicks and Bihai and others, you know, that then, then and we started, I started to speak about the flow, but, but he is speaking about flow, which means that when, when you are doing something and you enjoy it and you forget about the time, you feel the flow. But unfortunately, the people are making a cost-benefit analysis, you know, that so a lot of, a lot of uh, person, you know, that making a cost-benefit analysis and instead of playing with the child, visiting friends, you know, that were parents, you know that they are making money. They are sacrificing the free time and they will be not happy. So it means that the happiness is something, you know, which, which basically depends not on money but on, on the relations. And Tsitovsky wrote this earlier, you know, that he published a book in, in the US. This is the joyless economy. And basically he said that all those who have more leisure than they know what to do with and suffer from uninterrupted chronic boredom, you know that this hunger is like the hunger for food. Those who are, who are getting no food, you know that they will rub some uh, magazines, you know that, and, but those who are, who are having no normal life, you know that they, they will the, the border don't will make them, you know, the Vandal. Vandals, you, and, and it's, it's a very uh, dangerous phenomenon, you know, that and we, we, we would need to, to deal with it. 
So you see this beautiful stuff in order to, and, and he said, unfortunately, the money is never enough. You see these guys, you know, that they, they are full of food, but they still would like to eat. They, they are not able to stand up, but they, they have still the, the tools in their hands, and they would like to, to, to take it. Mean, meanwhile, you <coughs> see a beautiful picture in order that the people are, the beautiful people are dancing in order that enjoying the dance in order and basically they enjoy the relations and this is the so-called Sitovsky zone in order which which would, would tell you that 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 we have to stop the greediness we don't need so much material consumption in order that if we would distribute the income more evenly in order than we, we would have a more stable democracy and 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 we, we could we could solve the majority of the problems. And, and in order that I would like to finish with this picture, in order that, that, that you know, they are working, working for us and they never sent us a bill. So please try to enjoy, enjoy the life and try to not forget the bees, you know, that, and take care of the biodiversity and, and climate change. And we are able to stop it if we will change the economy. And we approach these uh, problems differently. Thank you for your